View from the Gutters, episode 59. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss The Private Eye, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 111.04. So, are we good? Are we good? Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we good? Are we good? Are we ready? Uh, yeah, what, what is this, 58? This is 59. Uh, 59. 59. Oh, Jesus is... Christ. This Jesus is... Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christos. Is 59 uh, a prime number? Start the episode yes. off by talking about math. That that's would be right. riveting. That's always... Yeah. Yeah. It is. Is right. it a Fibonacci prime? Oh, my God. No. Is it a happy prime? I'm fucking done. No. I'm done with this Wait. show. I don't think so. Is there such... Okay, never mind. I don't want to get into it. Never mind. Right. No. Yeah. You from the gutters. Episode 59. Yeah, 59. I'm Tobias Panchin. I'm Andrew Chard. I am Joe Pretty. Motherfucker, you're just going to skip me? I thought we were I'm going so to... Oh, oh, this, I'm oh, all oh, thrown oh, off. Eric Manning. Chard goes first. Fun, fun. I see. See, I'm gone for a few episodes. I have happens. been going second because I quit until Toby says, and I'm to buy a pension, and I have to rejoin the show. <laughs> <laughs> you guys drive me insane in these pre-episode rambles now. Talking about like prime literally numbers. insane. Yeah. I have always Lost been the one it. who's like, okay, let's go, let's start. <laughs> I've just given up on. I mean, that. I think our plan <laughs> is just, finally working. I'm just gonna let Joe tire himself out before the episode, and then once the episode starts, we'll just fall asleep. That's probably the best way. That's to what go. we did on ElfQuest. Anyways, and I'm Cade Reynolds. <laughs> hey, hi, Cade. <laughs> How are you doing Cade? today? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. I good. see you've got your green linen shirt on. Yeah, yeah St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day, Patrick's day. Yes. which is the day that it is when we're recording. Yay! So if it's loud outside and you hear ambulances or explosions... It's there like... was already at least one OD slash yeah. someone too drunk to hang. There were like four cop cars and a fire engine that almost hit me Yeah, yeah. on our way over here. Someone threw a bottle earlier today. I was like, it is 11 in the morning, sir. <laughs> like, you need to slow your roll. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I got, I got here at like seven thirty. I was like, "Geez, old Olympia, let's let's slow it down just a little bit. We got a lot of a night left." But oh. you know, my <laughs> friend was trying to convince me to go have breakfast with him and start drinking then. Well, it's not just St. Patty's Day. Today is also Week Eleven for Evergreen, so nobody's oh. got classes. Yeah, there we go. That yeah, so, so it's uh, spring break for a lot of people. Yeah, in Evergreen town. being the local oh, college yes. in yeah. this town. The Evergreen yeah. State College with a specialization in basket weaving and underwater yeah. basket weaving. Yeah, I graduated from there. I got uh, two stars, a smiley face, and an alligator. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what any of that means. but I was on the happy face roll, which was just a thing that I said because there, there's no anything at Like Evergreen. a roll? It was a roll. Or like, like you were on a roll? Oh, no, like, like a honor roll. roll. Like, oh, okay. uh, yeah. I, I thought you meant like I was on a roll getting those happy faces. Yeah. <laughs> I think I graduated. I had to like go to the back door and knock three times and somebody like shoved a diploma under the crack. Yeah. I don't know that I'll ever get a diploma from there. They're just like, oh, yeah, you're done. I have am going to. I, I have world. to walk because when I walk, I'm going to get them to say something strange as my middle name. And that will be... Because I'm 14 inside. Yeah, and they may don't I, may care I recommend, or check. May no, I they don't care. They really uh, don't care, Jack. Fernberger. Fernberger. Because no, no matter what you come up with, somebody there has something either even stranger as their actual name. name. That's actually true. Yeah, yeah, you should try Fernberger and or penis vagina. Penis. I was going to try. Joe, uh, penis I was actually going to see if, they, if I could get them to say Batman. I Joe. think they'll know that that's not a real name. But I was going to spell it funky. They'll probably be like Bateman. I was going to spell it like B A H T, like M O N. Batman. 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 I went there, there was a dude named Sparkle. And that was his real name. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Was Sparkle a stripper? That's what I want to know. I don't think so. <laughs> he was about 300 pounds, he was like six foot seven. 
Uh, he had dreadlocks. They were about four yeah, and a half feet now, long. There's, so a, mar- there's a market for to the show. He's somebody's this fantasy. Be like, this motherfucker was <laughs> shit about you. You should go kick his ass, ass Sparkle. You need to go through <laughs> and I beep out ble- random parts of that. You need to beep out that whole thing. It's just going to be a solid. Thank you guys for listening to that solid wall of beep for four minutes. It should just be like his name Jesus. was Beep and he was six foot Beep and weighed 300 <laughs> Beep. And- well, I think they're going to know if you say he weighed 300. <laughs> I'm guessing, should... fill in the blanks, probably pounds. <laughs> no, I'm not ounces. a fucking mathematician or a doctor. It could but be I'm... kilos. You don't know. 300 stone? <laughs> be a fucking planet? It's like a giant. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Do you know how measurement works? Yes, I do. I know. He's actually a Chrysler Macro Astro Band. Sparkle. Yeah, good The whole Lord. time. <laughs> he was really he was actually the moon it he was just a, decided to come down and sparkle mogo go to fucking sparkle get mogo like the planet from earth, it's like from earth planetoid, three like yeah. around and here. what's amazing Christ. is that despite the fact that it is St. Patrick's Day none of us have been drinking no, to my knowledge I'm drunk I'm, also, dr- I'm Irish for real so I just you know drink when I fucking want to yeah all the time. but yeah uh, not, not right at the moment so what I'm are we drunk talking about because I normally am see drunk I'm not drunk because I'm broke so if you guys want to get me drunk, donate at viewfromthegutters.com. There's some rum. <laughs> PayPal beer fund. <laughs> PayPal is exactly. Good. There's some rum in that fridge right next to you, Cade. You're good to go. Oh, snap. Oh, um, shit. There's no mixers, though. Good luck. Uh, three do, hours <laughs> later, there's like a broken window. I do want to have a drunk cast at some point. We did. We have before. You, we, have one you? of our special episodes, we got Yo, our, our very we first. Got a, bonus, a couple of episodes. Our very we first bonus episode was on your birthday. Oh yeah! And I brought you a twelve pack. Well, of and beer. we did the Emerald we... City, and I had had one drink, but Kirby and Kaylee, who are both on that Emerald City episode, like when we went last year, they've both been drinking. I had no idea. Yeah, Man. I just been hanging out in the hotel room by myself. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hey. You know what? That was just a clusterfuck of a situation. It always is. But we're excited to go this year. We, I am fucking stoked. Yeah, I guess we, uh, we should probably and... announce the fact that we're going to be at Emerald City. We are. Yeah, in we are no not, official capacity. We are not allowed to interview you. If you want an interview from us, do not come up to us and pretend like we're interviewing you because we will get kicked out. That's true. Yeah. Also, if you see us... Don't approach us because we're not very... That's why we do a podcast. We're not very social people at all. <laughs> We're afraid of people, actually. Yeah. I mean, we just... I use a body double for the video show, so you guys won't just, know who I am. I'll just, just curl like, up in the fetal <laughs> position and just cry until you go away. Like, hey, you're on view from the gutters, and I will weep. <laughs> actually, that's an animatronic puppet that I climb inside and pretend to be in <laughs> yeah, charge. Like I yeah, spent a lot show. of time making that. <laughs> I bet you did. It's like the Zorgs from uh, Fraggle Rock. Oh, I thought you were going to say it's, it's like the... Or wait. Is white, it, it's not model. Zorgs. It's no, it was the... Um, Gorgs. Yeah. I thought, I thought it was giving me it, like a It's a very model. lifelike puppet, though. You can like... It really feels it's, good. It's robotic. <laughs> There's actually there's actually a guy off camera with like a remote control who's working the eyes. It's, no, it's really good. I'm, it's really I'm confusing. done again. Oh, so yeah. and that leads a I really nice segue more. into what we're talking about today, which is the private eye, which was yeah. Public. Joe, you pitched it. Yeah. Would you want to talk about it? Uh, no, I I don't really have anything. To say. Good. Great. Um, moving on. Kate, all right. You got podcast anything? over. Nothing cool. <laughs> Tell me. No, good. Let's go home. Jared's in a mood tonight. I love it. <laughs> Let's fuck with him. Um... <laughs> So the private eye. Uh, so I think I we had talked about the private eye on the podcast right when it first the first issue came out, and yeah. I downloaded it because it's um, it's pay what you want and yeah. it's go, you're going directly through them. There's no middleman there, and uh, I downloaded it and I didn't read it for the longest time, and then I just recently read it because I saw that more issues were out and. I read through up through like four, and I really, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, I think the coolest thing about it is just the way it's like portrayed on the page, or I say page, but it's on your tablet or your computer or you know whatever you're using to read it. Like it's entirely, it exists only in a digital format, and which really changes the way you interact with it. And I like it because. Uh, I think it allows um, the creative team to kind of 
do more with it. They can uh, they can tell they can give you more information visually, but especially when there's like an action scene or something, it allows them to kind of impart more action because they have a, a longer canvas. I really hope when they print the uh, when they do the print versions that you hold it sideways from a normal book, so you're opening it from the bottom to the top, so you get the full page. I don't I, know that they'll I, ever print it. I. I mean, I would like... No, they are. They, yeah, they actually announced it. Yeah, there's a print version coming, um, they said. I think that... I wonder if it'll be more like Mouse Guard, though, where it, like... Yeah. You know, that that would make, I would imagine it being, like, a... I'm assuming that it is. I actually have a different comic that's the same format, like, um, the in terms of the shape of the page. Yeah. And it's basically just well, side style, like Battle an old Pug. comic strip. Battle yeah. Pug is like that too. The, the Mike Norton's Battle Pug. The, the, uh, the one I have is printed. The Adventures of Superhero Girl by, um, oh God, what's her name now? Faith Aaron Hicks. Mm. Which I've thought about bringing a few times, but I, I haven't screwed up the wherewithal to do it. Mm. It's a good comic. I'm just not sure there's a whole lot to say about it. All right. right. Well, Joe, I'm sorry I cut you off. Continue. No, it's cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's really. Uh, the it's visually stunning. Like right now, the story is still kind of, especially for the kind of story they're telling, it's still in its burgeoning stages, you know. But like, well, uh, it's half it's, done. Uh, it said on the website they're only doing they're 10, only doing ten issues, and it's it's done. So um, they're just releasing it monthly. I mean, I I have to assume that most of the information we're going to get is going to be in that next. I mean, definitely with the ending of issue five, that gives you a big clue as to what's going to happen and why, maybe why things have been happening. But um, I think it's the kind of story that's more difficult to talk about because when you don't have all the pieces, because obviously with the kind of story they're telling, how they resolve it is a huge part of it. Well, But I think... That's one of the cool things. That's why I wanted to talk about it. Because a lot of time we wrap up arcs and that cuts out speculation and what we'd like to see. And I think that's very interesting to me. I also love how visual, I find this book to be visually stunning. Like it's, it's a feast for the eyes. And even though it, it's has some very noir elements as in like the, the, the PI, the, the paparazzo and they call him a paparazzi, but that's plural. A singular paparazzi is a paparazzo. I'm sorry I had to say that because it's been bugging me. But, uh, um, which, it's it's a very kind of traditional noir setup, noir setup, but the colors are so bright and most of this stuff is happening during the day and everything is very, like, it pops on the page or on the, on the screen and I love that about it. Um, and I really like the uh the central concept i like how kind of people hide their identity and like not everything is kind of like there was this big internet blow up where all your information was made available for everybody else to see and so now people are like ultra 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 reserved and ultra private and well and also is... their technology is very you know uh very much about that in and yeah. too because you see like the his grandpa trying to use his phone, phone or get on and to he's play like that shit hasn't worked on... in like 60 years and like there's no multiplayer on consoles the private eye he still listens to music and records now yeah. because like there's no reason to use like and, well, spotify they have, or cloud or they have a that. library yeah, yeah like there's the internet actual... is gone that's yeah. not a thing that exists anymore and that's yeah. that is my single favorite thing about this is that so many times when you're looking at like far flung future <laughs> sci-fi stuff the internet factors so much, and since like the since the cyberpunk movement, the internet has like been such a major facet of that. The ability to get your hands on any kind of information that you want, pretty much at your fingertips, and I love that that's not a part of this story. It's, I love that it's about getting information. I love that the internet is not a thing. It's almost the exact opposite of Transmetropolitan. Yeah, and that way it is. I think it shares, I th- I think spiritually it reminds me of Transmet and the fact that it's kind of like tech that's way, way advanced. But rather than kind of everything being connected, everything is, is disparate. Everything is separate. And, and I, I really that's, like that. that's actually the part of the comic book that rang the falsest to me, the fact that the internet does not exist in any way. And it kind of bothered me. But listening to you talk about it and the reasons that you, you give for it, purely from an artistic perspective. Yeah. Like I understand why they did that and kind of what they were trying to tell just in terms of like, okay, this is a story where if, 
Well, and I don't think it's just that the internet doesn't exist anymore because I think it exists. Like they talk about it. I, like, yeah. they need I to thought bring there was at least back. a panel in here where someone had some like it's like an underground thing though. Like, yeah, I swear. Yeah. I swear I but gotta, what the it. problem is is that I when I imagine they talk about like the cloud burst, you know. Yeah. I think that it's just like all that information got jumbled out there, and so like they have not spent the time to sort it out. So it's just more efficient for you to go pick up a book, right? To learn the information. Well, and yeah. well, the, by logging on. Mm-hmm. To the internet you're now vulnerable because like your whole anonymity has been compromised the uh the big reveal at the end of the fifth issue the guy saying yeah. um some guy interested in bringing back whatchamacallit the old yeah. fad and it's not something that like exists underground it's something that they're talking about like right we need to recreate this right internet right yeah, I mean, like, I, I just think that it, like, it fell out of favor because it was less efficient anymore, right? right? And it's like, the, I, maybe that could never happen, really, but, like, also how much of sci-fi could could actually happen, well, you know? Yeah. It's like, you just take one part of our life, and you're like, what if, you know, we could build giant planet-sized space stations? Like, what would that be like? And then you can tell stories about that. And so, <clears throat> it is a very cool imagining of, like, oh, what if something crazy <clears throat> happened to the internet? Something we rely on every day. Yeah, well, I, I think that it's very much within the mainstay of that old style science fiction like you oh, yeah. change one thing yeah yeah and you see what happens and right. their central thesis is you know your data is fundamentally insecure on the internet like right. anything that you put on there is open for people to find right you know, what happens you know what if everybody's information was right out there in a way that anybody can look at right. what would happen yeah yeah and i think that's the kind i think that for me separates you know, there are stories where you you're you're doing well, what if this just for the hell of it? And I think that those can be a lot less satisfying. But when you're saying, what if this for this specific purpose? What if this technology existed specifically as a lens through which we can view this story? Right. I think that that's that's storytelling. And I think that that has a much I think that speaks to having a, a clear vision of the story you want to tell. As opposed to just like, oh, we're just going to do all this really cool, like, super science shit, but just because it's cool. And I'm like, well, that's cool, but, like, you got to have something else there. Right. Well, the best science fiction, it's not about, like, oh, look at, like, this really – they're on their spaceships and they're shooting broadsides and planets are exploding and, oh, my God, all this crazy stuff. It's about putting a mirror up to society yeah. and twisting it. Just a little bit, so it reflects in a way that you didn't expect, and that tells you something about who who we are yeah. as a people. Absolutely. Well, and it's really easy to lose sight of the greater message for the lightsabers and the cool spaceships and all that shit. But like when you get down to the guts of it, like that's why reading sci-fi is such a fascinating exercise in explorative fiction. It's just yeah. like. It's easier to talk about stuff when it's removed from us very slightly. Oh, well, yeah. And still talk about issues that are very real today. Well, and I think you almost kind of have to do that. I I um I gave a presentation once in like a film class where I talked about the reason movies are so successful as a medium is because they allow a filmmaker to say, "Look at this thing. There's a thing we do." And remove all judgment from the audience, the the part of the audience yeah. that normally goes, I don't fucking do that. I'm a good person. Right. You can use that. And because it's a movie, because it's removed from us, people are a lot more likely to be like, oh, wow, that's a, that's kind of shitty. Yeah. And and I think successful fiction in general, uh, or well, successful science fiction, that's, yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that makes it successful is whether or not you can, it works on that level. Because I think it's a it's a it's an important thing, you know. It's an important thing to kind of have. It's all well and good to like read something where everything is kind of given to you on the page, but I think it's one of the things that is really important. And I talk about this with my kid, and that's one of the reasons I do this podcast is because sometimes it's nice to dig for shit, you know, to get a oh, book yeah. and be like, I don't know what this means. I want to know what it means, so I'm going to go out and talk to people about it until I come up with some kind of idea based in the text. Of what it means. I think that's important and I think it's satisfying. And I, I'm glad that you said that because I actually came into this podcast not sure how I felt about this comic. And I was leaning towards not liking it. And now that we've actually started to talk about it and really get into it, I think I do like it. It's exaggerated for a specific effect. Mm-hmm. 
and it's pushing things like to a you know way 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 extreme because it's trying to say kind of some specific things that you yeah. normally wouldn't see in where we are as a civilization today and i feel like i can't quite judge it as a work because it's not done yeah. right. i don't know how it ends but i think i'm going to come out of this liking it where i went into it not liking it well i think it's like some of the stuff is really nail on, on the head of or hammer on the head of the nail where it's like the bad guy is television and like you know he's a dickhead yeah. And one of my favorite scenes in the whole book is when she's like, uh, <laughs> unless you'd prefer some oral satisfaction and it's like a shot was... of him. And then it pans out to this like wide shot of his desk with the like TV symbol above his head. And it's like watching like, you. Yeah. And then he's like, yeah, actually a blowjob would be great. Thanks. <laughs> it's like, what a scumbag. Like, like, you, just, you have a, such a visceral reaction to that guy. Yeah. You know nothing about those two's relationship. Like they could be married for all you know. They're not. It's his secretary. But, like, you don't really know. But they set the scene up in a way to just make you go, what a fucking dirt bag. Yeah, and no, it, it, it's, like, really, that's great. And that's all you really need in a story to set up a villain sometimes. Like, sometimes fiction spends too much time focusing on the villain to the point where I like the villain more than the main character because you spent all your time explaining to me yeah, why he's right? so, like, like he's a guy. And now I just like the villain. And when the hero wins at the end, I'm going to be unsatisfied because now I wanted that guy to do better. But well, sometimes certain... that's the point is to show oh, the villains who men. Yeah, well, but if you you're going to end it villain. with the hero beating the villain and going, yeah, we did it. And you go, well, I don't. Well, now I'm left really unsatisfied by that ending. Well, I actually I've talked to my brother about this a lot. And villains are often more interesting by than heroes because oh, yeah. you know what are the characteristics of a hero uh they're heroic they're good and upstanding yeah. and morally correct they, and they do the right thing and, and they help they people don't make mistakes and, and they're fucking boring yeah you know villains are proactive and they're making plans and yeah. they're setting agendas and they're going out and doing things and they give reasons for why they want to do things and they're unsatisfied with reality yeah. because they're trying to make a change of some kind they're probably fucking evil. They probably hurt people and they are doing babies. atrocious things. Yeah. But they have a lot more character than yeah. heroes, especially when you're talking about things aimed at younger children. Yeah, well, definitely. I think that there, I think there lies the the difference between like a really well written hero and a really poorly written hero, because a hero can't. To be interesting, a hero can't just go, well, I do the right thing because it's right. It was the big complaint with DC for a long time was like, you know, Absolutely. why does Superman do what he does? He does it because it's right. You know, why does Green Lantern do this? Because he upholds the law and the justice of the universe, right? Space law. Space, space law. law. But That's like sky law, but in space. I think that a hero can be equally interesting if he's written well because... A hero has to make difficult decisions and he has to make choices and really interesting heroes make mistakes and they fail and they're human and they're often portrayed as like uh, more out of their depth than a villain because like a villain has time to calculate and plan and put plans into action that makes heroes really reactionary which if you write them poorly can just like totally destroy that character because oh, he just feels like a non character like we talked about in uh, Joe the Barbarian. Like, he's just a passive hero. Like, he's just along for the ride. Right. Um, but a really interesting hero can, like, shit can happen to him, and the way he reacts to that makes him a more interesting character. The prime example, in my mind, of the passive hero that is insanely interesting is Corbin Dallas from ah, Fifth yeah, Element. Yeah, right. Because he's, that, like, <laughs> out of his depth the whole fucking time. Like, yeah... Uh, what's his name uh, that Gary Oldman plays yeah. is probably more interesting than Corbin That guy's Dallas. name actually Zorg. is Zorg. It's Zorg, Zorg yeah. yeah. It's Emmanuel Jean-Baptiste something Zorg. Yeah, his name is Zorg. Like, I... I mean, that character is really interesting, too, but Corbin Dallas is like, you know, the way he reacts to things makes him an interesting character, and the opening scenes that show him the flaws that he has and the, like... God, now I want to go home and watch well, that It's a great so movie. Good. You should watch it all the time. It's, 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 it's a, a cigarette. <laughs> fucking fantastic movie. Yeah. But, you know, it's the little things they do to set him up uh, 
as a character, you know, like, oh, his driver's license is expired because yeah. he doesn't really follow the law very much. And he, his ex-wife is really annoying and he's got a cat that he likes. And he ignores and, like, his mom. He yeah, ignores all, his mom. And it's just it. like, it just is set up really With well. Two points left on your license. Yeah. It just is it's a great job to do that. Yeah. So that's what I really like about this character, too, is, and like most noir detective stories, like, the detective is the one doing a lot of the reacting because yeah. someone comes to him with a problem and then like great detective fiction very quickly, the rug is pulled out from under him and yeah. everything goes fucking horribly wrong. And although we haven't really seen the lengths at which he will go to do the right thing, like he's still just on a payroll and that's why he's doing this. You can start to see that he actually cares about his clients even though uh, one of my favorite scenes is when uh, he goes to the fish guy's house yeah. and he needs information and from he's him. Just like, and he's just like, no, I'll fucking ruin you. Yeah. Like, I know everything about you. Like, you trusted me and that's great. And I don't want you, I don't want to have to betray your trust. But well, I need a favor now. That's, and it's I, like, he's very cold hearted in that moment. And I can relate to him a lot more because he's not yeah. just the, you know, the archetypal hero. Well, and I, I think that's why I'm kind of I like him is because I think the 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 hard boiled dick mm-hmm. has its place in literature, but oh yeah, he's he subverts a lot of the the tropish nature of that that character by by doing that. Like he is not reacting, which I think is I, I think that he's doing what he can, and when yeah. he's like, "Listen, I will fucking sell you," yeah, out, period. But then when the guy capitulates, he's like, oh, I'll send that letter to your old girlfriend, too. Because, right. you know, I got your back, right? Right. Like, well, and also when they get caught, he punches him in the face. Yeah, because to make, he, it, to look make like it look like he was not uh, assisting in, the, uh, in yeah. the robbery. And it was like, you know, he, he does care about his clients. No, oh, absolutely. But he's definitely got like, he's going to he do what he needs to do. Lines yeah. to get shit done. Which is what I like about him. Maddox, you haven't talked too much. Do you want to? Is there something you want to add, or any particular feelings about it? I, uh, you know, actually, just reading it, um, I was noticing a lot of just small details in the book that make me. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned yet. This is Brian K. Vaughn is the writer yes. on this, yeah. and Marcus, Marcus Martin. Martin. Yeah. Uh, so that that's definitely important. The with the um, the whole internet release thing, I think it's important to mention that these guys both had pretty healthy careers before doing this i think it's really cool they're doing it i love oh, it yeah their, their website's called panel syndicate yeah and yeah the way they're doing it like when you when you buy it it goes directly to marcos martin's paypal account yeah which is really cool so it's direct to them and i love that um yeah and you can send a message to them yeah just it's really cool and I, what you I actually, like about it what you when i bought the first uh or when after i read the first issue and i sent the second one and i sent him a message and was like hey we really love what you're doing and i signed it me and then be from the gutters too so Nice. Hopefully they got that. So, awesome. Saw that we liked it. So sorry. Eric. No, it's all, it's all good. Yeah, I'm it's imagining good. like a ticker tape machine that prints out all of the messages that they get, <laughs> and then it just goes directly in a waste paper basket. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I imagine like those old timey guys that just read the stocks off the ticker tape. It just goes between them, and they're like in these big overstuffed armchairs yeah. sipping brandy, and they like look at it. Hmm, some more people bought our book, hmm, and then right but, into the but, trash. But, but they're but, wearing but, tiger masks. Oh yeah, while they're doing it. Yeah, they're 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 Holographic tiger masks. Holographic tiger masks. Uh, no, it's. Uh, I think it's a great book. Um, you gotta talk I've, into the microphone, Eric. I've been into it since <laughs> the first one came out. Um, I've been trying to tell everyone I know to buy it. Um, personally, I pay a dollar for each one because I think that's a fair price for it. And that's what they even and, say on the website. And I, I think it's ridiculous to pay more ever. Like Comixology, I buy a lot of stuff when you know it's on sale, but I, I never buy a book at like a full print cover price because that's ridiculous. Um, I don't pay full retail for anything because I'm poor slash cheap. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I work at a comic book store, so I get a 20% discount. So yeah, I never pay full price for anything if I don't have to. Uh, but yeah, uh, I really love it. I was noticing flipping through this that uh, when uh, when they're talking in uh, episode or issue four, they're standing in front of Madonna's grave. 
<laughs> which I didn't notice, oh, and I've read this no. book like twice. Yeah, and she already. dies in like 2017. And, yeah, in 17, and in the and it's like and it's like the big coned bra like statue of her. So this is I just I, don't know, I thought that was really funny. There's a lot of little stuff. So this that's the thing is, and that's I guess the important thing is that I feel like you guys covered a lot of the you know actual story points, but the uh, the art on this is such that you cause again I've, I've re- read the entire thing twice, and this was just a third time flipping through it as we were you know getting ready to talk, and uh, that's not the only thing I noticed, but this all these little little tiny details in there and some of them are kind of seemingly in, inconsequential like the madonna thing i don't imagine will come up but it's just kind of a funny nod to pop culture um but yeah marcus martin puts a lot of uh just you know little little easter eggs in there you know to me that's that's something i mean it's a great story i'd go back and reread it every once in a while anyway but now like just flipping through i'm like dang i want to read that again like right now because like what the hell else did i miss because before i'm like i'm trying to get the story first but i'm like well no i know the story i just want to stare at the page you know? Well, there's Absolutely. also, there's definitely, like, uh, a lot of art, like, things that are revealed to you only through the art in this book, uh, that the private investigator is smoking weed all the time, like, that's only revealed to you through right. the art. Right, when like, you see, like, the marijuana, it looks, it's the, it it's looks on like, his, Marlboro, like but, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. like, on his Marlboro packs, but there, it's, like, a pot leaf, and it actually says marijuana, it's yeah. just always covered up by, it's, like, always slightly obscured by a hand or something on there, and it's, like, well, it is LA, and it is the future, so, like... I could totally imagine that. It's a, I love that scene in Layer Cake where he's like talking about how someday in grocery stores you'll be able to go buy. Go and buy joints. Yeah, well, not even joints, just like he's walking down that aisle and it's filling up with like heroin and cocaine and like Oh, that yeah. Stuff. That movie is criminally underappreciated. That movie is great. It's great. great. I think, it, yeah, it's uh, definitely a cult classic. People people talk about it. But I, yeah, the art stuff is great. I think you nailed it on that one. Yeah, the art is definitely one of my favorite parts about this. I mean, uh, yeah, Marcus Martin, I guess for the <clears throat> listeners that aren't terribly familiar, um, I came in, he did a lot of the art when they were doing the the brand new day stuff in Spider-Man mm-hmm. after the worst story ever, the one more day, That's don't ever read that unless you really want a bad story. But anyways, Brand New Day, a lot of that stuff, that whole era, a lot of that stuff was actually really cool. They had a rotating uh, cast of writers and artists at the time. So at that point, Amazing Spider-Man was coming out three times a month, and they did this for like about a year or so straight. Like I had an entire short box that was just one year on Spider-Man because I bought everything at the time. I think that we know, looking at what sells, that there are some people who do like terrible stories. Right. I, oh, like what? Like yeah. One more, day, one more day sold. I mean, I know it sold, and it makes me sad. It was uh, specifically a dick. Me and me and Toby like to have this conversation where he'll just be like, "Have you noticed all the new Fifty Two stuff up on our comic books?" And I go, "Yeah," and I downvote all of them <laughs> because really, fuck those stories, fuck them. But the the thing that this comic actually reminded me most of visually is Zot. Yeah. Like, I think it has kind of that same really kind of wild, flavorful, the future is full of just random crazy stuff yeah. element. That I think is also present in uh, Futurama. Yeah. Yeah. And I think obviously both of them were influenced by Zod. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, was there anything that you wanted to say, Cade? I feel like you were winding up for something right when I started talking. Oh, uh, no, I wasn't. I was waiting for a break, though, to say what I thought. Um, Go right ahead. So I ate this book up. I did not expect to going into it. Um, I started reading the first one while I was waiting for Netflix to charge my credit card so I could continue watching Archer. And I just started the first one. And then like 40 minutes later, I realized I was out of issues to read. It's a quick read. I was surprised how fast I read it. It is. And it was... It was just awesome. I started reading it again. I didn't finish it because I don't know why. But um, it it was very disheartening. After I finished it, I went back to the website just to, you know, on the off chance that Six had come out already. And, of course, it hadn't. But I was reading on the website that it was only going to be ten issues and that they had already finished it and were... Well, putting it out. so um, ten issues in this first arc. Like, who's to say that they won't go explore this universe more? Yeah, it's well, an interesting world. That technically, they could go back no. To. Like, like, it's possible they could shut it down. I, I think on a certain level, I'd rather an artist do a ten issue series and then be done with it and go on and tell another story. Like, stories don't have to be long. 
a lot of stories. I mean, they used to publish a lot of short stories. Yeah. Short stories don't get published no, anymore. And I it, and I like the idea of a creator having the freedom where they don't have to say, well, I have to build my brand. I have to tell this. I created these characters. I created the story. I have to tell the same story for the next 30 years because if I stop, nobody's going to know who I am anymore. Yeah. Like, I like the idea that somebody can create something, put it out, sell it. And then move on and do something completely different from that. No, that's very true. I just, I found myself liking it so much that I wanted it to be as long as Transmetropolitan. Well, yeah. I, I got the same vibe reading this as I did for with Transmetropolitan, and that is saying a lot, since that is my favorite comic book of all time. Well, there's something to be said, too, about the opposite of the short story, where it's like, you know, Jeff Smith takes however long he takes to make Bone, and it's like, because he's putting it out independently, he can spend all the time he wants on it. And tell the full story and then finish it when it's done. Like, I also really love that, too. And Or, like, ElfQuest, you know, like something that just takes a really long time to come out. And well, I, I they think can spend Elfquest, time on it, but it's rare. I think ElfQuest might be an example of a story where the artist didn't know when to stop. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said for stopping before you've said everything you have to say three times over. No, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Well, and I think the, the the cool thing about this format is that – because, I, I mean, I think – yeah, I, I agree with Toby that if I would rather have a, a story be concise and 10 issues rather than have it go 15 or 20 issues and be filled with filler and the story goes on too long and they have to introduce plot points that don't go anywhere, I would rather have it short and sweet. And especially that's – that is – the uh, that is the creed of the the detective novel is short and sweet like boom boom done. Well, yeah and... and but the the great thing about this genre in general is that it is typically episodic in nature oh yeah so this could be this ten issue they could revisit it and if it does yeah. well then why wouldn't they but they would be telling a different story with different characters in it and that that's cool because you either have this like great story that's self contained and never has an opportunity to go wrong right? or, but the world is still there. They can come back and revisit it at any time they want and tell a yeah. different story in it. That's true. And I yeah. hope they do that as mostly. Well, what and the I'm interesting saying. thing too, is since they're, since they're doing this direct themselves, there's no ads or anything. If you look at the actual page count, I mean, it is a quick read, like we mentioned, but each, uh, each, uh, issue is about 32 pages or so. So if there's gonna be 10, you do the math on that, you know, throw in supplementals, you know, that's still going to be about a 400-page book or so. That's still a pretty yeah. big tome, you know, especially even if it's a hardcover. So it'd still be a pretty beefy story right? yeah, as far absolutely. as, like, a physical product out there on a bookshelf, you know. I'm that's just looking true. at the issues on my iPad. They're 32, 28, 29, 31, and 29. So about 30 pages. Yeah, yeah. which is good. I mean, like, that's a big size book. I, and I, I do hope that the this big guys detective... are 20, you know, after ads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Yeah. I, I hope that uh, they do go back to this character. I would like because to it's see not it. even done, and I already want more, you know. But Absolutely. once it's finished, I'm going to be like, I need more of this character because his backstory we've barely even begun to scratch the surface of it, yeah. and he is a fantastically interesting character just in the people that he knows. Yeah, I absolutely. love the people in his life, and I would love to see the the woman he's solving the case with to start working with him. I think that'd be really cool. They yeah. have okay. a they have a dynamic that you don't see in a lot of characters. I, I, I don't want to break your heart, Cade, but one of the hallmarks of this kind of fiction is is they introduce you to really interesting characters and you never see them Take again. Them away. <laughs> I love the, the, girl, up, like, the girl that or they show up like later. once every ten yeah. books or something. Well, see, you know? Except I didn't really see this as detective fiction, so I'm not really following those same tropes. It's it's not. Um, I mean, it is detective fiction, but it's not. It it doesn't feel super like it because it's such a different setting and it's told in a way that is not yeah, traditional. Absolutely. Detective and I feel fiction. that they could tell so many different stories in this kind of world. It, yeah. Every book doesn't have to be a detective fiction. That's true, but they uh, they're clearly very influenced by by that genre by that guy. Those yeah. guys, like guys like Marlowe and and uh, you know. I mean, that, that's true. I just. And, I can see this going in a lot of places. Oh, and yeah. I really hope that it comes back after the 10 issues. But I, I want to know more about his driver, who I love. She's one of my favorites. Uh, she was my favorite in yeah. the entire oh, series. She's great. First of all, she cracked me up. Yeah. Lady, or is it Lady she's Numchuck? Like, it's Numchuck. And yeah, she was like, she's, I'm, she's trying to trying out all these different nims. And I love 
when uh, she picks them up from the library and she's just got a fucking the McDonald's, McDonald's bag, bag on her, her head. head. And she's like, well, if they fucking catch me, I could go, they could kick me out of high school. And the other lady, like, freaks out. She's like, you have children working for you. You have children working for you. <laughs> she's like, I'm a sophomore bitch or something. Uh, it was also, it's also interesting because they, oh, yeah. they already subverted one, tr- I guess, trope of the detective fiction that... Uh, P.I. is gay. Well, oh, absolutely. That, well, well, that or whole, bisexual. I mean, or bisexual, or it could be but bisexual, that, but that absolutely. romance yeah. element where the, you know, the girl gets killed right before the final showdown, like that yeah. has been subverted, at well, least to an extent. The more Maybe. important trope that they, I think they've kind of subverted by, by introducing that idea is the femme fatale, which yeah. is a big part of detective fiction. And you know what? She's I, not needed, and she's a, part, she's a part of a different age, and so I'm I kind of... I 100% disagree with both of you, because I think that that doesn't do... I mean, like, when I saw him... I mean, the scene that we're talking about, obviously, is when mm-hmm. he's talking to the other P.I., the mm-hmm. guy that taught him everything, his yeah. mentor who is clearly also his lover. Like, that doesn't automatically exclude women from from his love life. No, No, it doesn't, doesn't, but what I'm saying... And also, the femme fatale doesn't have to be a woman. Okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. So I don't think it's a very Well, no, but but, but that's that's what I mean, is that traditionally, femme fatale means deadly woman. And when you you make that character a male character or any other gender or whatever, then you're subverting the trope right there. You're adding something that's interesting because you've not seen that before. And that's why I say... Changing the rules. Yeah, Yeah. and that's that's the cool thing. I don't think it'll avoid the trope, but I do think that it could change it. Well, and that's what I mean by, like, I guess subverting it would be what I'm talking about. it's, It's taking an idea that... In its day, had was was somewhat you know kind of this this ideal situation, right? Which is like dames and bullets, and you got your heater on you, and hey, Charlie, I'm not your buddy pal. No, I'm not talking to you, Hemingway. I'm not talking to you, Hemingway. Hey there, hey, buddy, Pally. Hey, pal. hey there, Pally. You uh, know it's, what it's, are you fuckers talking we were, about? I was reading hey, a Marlo over there. You... I was reading this Marlo book recently. It's farewell, my lovely. And there's literally a whole page where it's like, "Who are you talking to, Pally? I don't know. I'm not spinning that tale, Hemingway." And it's just like a whole page of that. And I was Who's like, the mug? Good luck. Lord, what am, what am I doing? You better beat feet, Jack. It's just oh great. The way they talked, it was great. Uh, uh, um, it was, it was, uh, re- was what do you repartee? It was a different time, uh, man. Yeah. It was I'll a give you repartee. Uh, snappy, it was, I don't snappy know. Patter. It snappy was, patter. It was something. But, um, and, and it's interesting to me because of how often when that, when that story is done now, when that trope is done now, they revert back to all those old tropes. And this is going, hey, we can use this, but we can use it in a different way. We can make it interesting. Yeah. We can make it novel. Well, I, something that I've always I've always had the problem with for uh, detective fiction is whenever anyone does detective fiction in a modern setting, they're very, or any modern person likes to write detective fiction. I shouldn't say any, but most. They tend to revert to the fact that it's like, oh, these are guys, uh, you know, they, they smoke a lot and drink a lot and they go yeah. to bars and listen to jazz clubs and wear fedora. And it's like, whoa, that's not what a detective does. Yeah, no, 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 no. That was the era in that's which what, most of these books Marlo were did. written. The, yeah. Like, it's not a genre. That isn't the genre. The genre is like, it's a private detective. That's it. It's like saying that comic books are like, oh, and then they wear capes and fly around. It's like, whoa, that's not, you know. And so it really bothers me. And so this was a nice take on that. Is like they've yet to go to a jazz club or like he's not pouring out whiskey and you know yeah. it's it's just it was nice to see a genre that I really like about types of characters that I really like that were not just laden with tropes. Well, I yeah. really love it when they take this like one kind of setting mm-hmm. and mix it with a different kind of genre. Oh yeah. like I mean, um, Identity Crisis is not a superhero story. No, it's a detective story. Yeah, it's like a murder mystery. Yeah. Like I, I just it's really like the it. juxtaposition of those elements where Absolutely. it's like, yeah, you know, like, oh powers. yeah, well let's yeah, yeah let's like, do a romance where they're wearing capes and they fly around just because like it has nothing to do with superheroes. Noble That's causes, just the setting that it that it's in. Noble causes is a sitcom with superheroes. Like absolutely. It's, I mean, I think that those anytime anybody takes and starts to genre mash together. I have never met another person who's read that book. Noble causes. It's yeah, great. it's been. I have the first so three trades. Well. Jay Farber. I like that guy. He's from Seattle. What's up, Jake? From Seattle. <laughs> he's not listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, now he's not. No, well, now he's definitely not. No, you made but, uh, him feel awkward. Yeah. <laughs> 
But, uh, well, yeah, he was, like, at home alone listening to a show, and he's like, they'll never talk about Noble Cod. Wait, what? <laughs> hey, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> then he's lost his mind. No, uh, Jay Farber's a really nice guy. We got sketches from him. Or uh, as they got assigned uh, his pilot season uh, that he did about the detective. Um, there's, like, a Greek mythology private detective thing that he did for pilot season. It's good. I'll, it's in a box over here. I'll... I'll give it to you. Joe's looking at me like he wants to read it. Um, I'm interested in that. Yeah, but oh, Jay Farber's great. So yeah, Noble Causes though was very much like a genre mashup. So Noble Causes is actually what I was gonna bring for uh, if you liked Invincible, read. Well, now you spoiled it. Yeah, you ruined it. I might not even be on the episode, (laughs) so whatever. (laughs) Just be like. Beep it and beep the whole thing out. They'll be like, beep wait this a minute. Whole be... fucking episode out is what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> View from the gutters, episode 59. Beep. Just beep. leave all Fuck. the conjunctions. Yeah. It's like, episode, uh, it's View so from the gutters. <laughs> uh, Fuck and, you, Joe. Podcast but, canceled. Beep. However. Yeah. It would just take me forever to like go through and cut all those out. Anyway, that is one thing I really loved about the series the genre mashup. I think you like. It's it's a it's a futuristic setting, sort of like stuff we've seen before. It's similar to Futurama. It's similar to Transmet. It's well, and it's, I think it's cool, inspired by. Oh, it's, definitely, I mean, definitely it's, inspired it's, by. It's, it's and very and, experimental, and it's playing with its references. Yeah, yeah, which I like, and I like that it's not. I think a lot of times you'll be like, "We're going to tell a hard boiled detective story in the future, and it'll be Blade Runner." Yeah, and it's like, no, I'm glad oh. that you've gotten away from that. I'm glad, yeah. like. Everything is. I, there's I, not a lot of cyberpunk influence in this. Which no, is there's really not, which I like a lot because I love cyberpunk, but it's been done. Let's see new stuff. Come on. Well, it's there, where a lot of detective, futuristic detective stories end up is in cyberpunk. Yeah. There is one thing that really bothered me about this, and it's the way that the cloud burst was kind of exposition dumped at the beginning of the first issue. Yeah. Like, it just, it felt really kind of ham fisted. And like, here's this thing that you need to know. And I, then once you choke that down, the rest of it's good. I really wish that had just been on like the title page or in the intro. If yeah, it had right? just been like in this year, the cloud burst and like now everyone chooses to remain anonymous. Yeah. And then it wouldn't have had to have been in the exposition. Yeah. But and I would have been too easy to skip there. I, I think, maybe. I don't know. I really like the grandfather character. I think I he's cool. Him. And he's... I feel like that first introduction to him where that happened, even though it has nothing to do with him. Right made me hesitant to like him at first and right. they had to work to kind of build me back up. I can honestly say that that character is every single one of my wow friends. I, I well, wouldn't okay. be surprised. Well, to me, that I, was the whole point of that character. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, this is like our he's generation. Our generation. Yeah. 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 He's got the clothes. He's got the tattoos. He's yeah. got the yeah. video games. Why yeah. the fuck can't I play with people online? Yeah. His busted ass cell phone. It's like, how come this thing won't connect? Where's my three G? I got no bars. I got no bars, man. The the thing that I'm most excited about, though, is where you could go from here digitally. Because I'm thinking about like this is a comic that's specifically made for your digital reader or for your like for your widescreen monitor or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like that's really cool. And I started thinking. Like, how far is it until people start putting in, like, we already see stuff like Flash animations and Homestuck and stuff. How long before you're, like, you're kind of melding this idea of, like, a motion comic with something you read. And so you turn the page and a motion happens on the thing. But it's instead of it being this kind of, like, They've already shoddy... done that with um... Watchmen and there was a motion comic, but it was terrible. No. Well, most motion comics are terrible. That's How what long until they remix the Stanley Parable with a comic where you read it and one thing happens, and then the next time you read it, something different happens? Well, there was exactly this, there was exactly. this great uh, there was a great um, exhibit at the it was in a Seattle museum. It's the one that's on UW's campus. I don't remember what it's called, but they had a sequential art uh, exhibit. And I was there for something else, and that happened to be there. And I was like, ooh, I'm going to go check this out. And one of the things that they were talking about, there was this great video uh, kind of discussing why motion comics don't work and why the next step is creating interactivity within a motion comic. Because motion comics demand that you just watch them. Even if you are still reading the words, like you are a very passive. You're very passive. In that. The and interactivity is exactly what I'm so talking what about. So what he was creating was a comic where you had to tap to move the action forward. Yeah. And because it was all done in Flash, that meant that all of the dialogue bubbles and stuff that came up were in were not 
uh, like they are now as like um, Illustrator or Photoshop right, like elements. Static. Like they were actual type, and so he could translate into every language in the world using Google Translate. Like yeah. obviously that's, no, that's not great. And that's but, the kind of stuff I'm talking about. But that existed just in the or, way that he architect okay, so they're like um, architect of this uh um, well, comic I'll, just give me one second kate because i'm i want to get this thought out imagine if you could be reading uh if you were reading something and there was like bubbles to a flashback and you could hit the bubbles and it would pop up with just like a really brief animated flashback of what you were going what what that character was thinking about yeah or just just shit like this like mm-hmm. that's what kind of blows my mind about this is that more than the story, which is good, but it's the idea that I think is really excellent. It's it's moving the genre forward. And well, this is something that we, I think, all talk about and we all agree on, is pushing the boundaries of what can be done, especially in an age where digital comics should be more prevalent. Oh, we're way behind on digital yeah, comics. Yeah, we're bit. like super behind. And stuff like this is, this is great. And this the more popular this is and the more mm-hmm. the more it's able to do... The more you'll see other people doing it, and the more you'll, the faster you'll see a push towards shit that you can actually interact with. Because I don't know about you guys, there definitely is some stuff that you can interact with out there. There are guys who are building uh, web comics to be interacted with. Homestuck is interactive. Yeah, there's there's elements of that comic book that are video games. There's also (laughs) there are like choose your own adventure (laughs) online comics where like Um, you'll. You'll change well, your and responses Jason to stuff. Jason Shiga is doing and... that stuff too with books like Maybe, and mm-hmm. um, I'm totally spacing on the other one, but you can find it if you just Google Jason Shiga. Yeah. Don't you mean Meanwhile? Meanwhile, meanwhile. what did yeah. I say? Maybe. 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 Oh, I meant, oh, yeah, Meanwhile. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he made another one, but I can't remember what it yeah. is. But uh, like, I mean, I, I literally have read that book more than any other book I've had in my collection because it's a choose your own adventure. Yeah. And the way it's done is like the most novel thing I've ever seen. So, yeah, it's true. I, I think that there's so much to be said about digital comics. Yeah, uh, but this, I mean, even just the distribution method on this, I'm a hun- I'm a huge fan of because the money goes straight to the creator. Which like I'm I said a huge on the last fan episode. Of. I want to say know. a couple I, things. Um, oh, sorry, go yeah. ahead, Cade. Okay, so first off, when you said that the way that it was uh, done, I want to say that it was absolutely beautiful on my Microsoft Surface Pro. It mm-hmm. was, it looked like it was made to be read on it, which well, was yeah. awesome. Um, secondly, I hope more people pay for it because in the FAQ yeah. on the website, they do say that uh, people paying for it is going to depend on whether or not there's more in the future. Oh, yeah. Um. I can, something I that, can tell you as somebody who has a pay what you want digital product on the internet, people do pay for it. Yeah. Pay okay. Three dollars this month. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and the dog. other thing was, is that that kind of flash comic you were talking about, Joe, Mark Wade's insufferable, uh, which is hosted on thrillbent.com, is that when you hit next page, there are animations and then there's new bubbles to read about the characters talking. Yeah. And then you hit next page again, and they move again, and there's new bubbles up. Yeah. And so it it really is like an interactive Flash comic book written by Mark Wade. Marvel has been doing something similar to that as well. They call them infinite comics, where you turn the page digitally, but it's the same. It's like the same page, but then new stuff has been added to it. So you'll like have a panel or a page that is a panel, and there'll be certain characters, and they'll be there talking, and then you hit next page and more wood word bubbles pop up, but the image stays the same. Not a huge fan of that method, but people are just trying a lot of different things. Oh, yeah. It's a very experimental period. Well, the more that the, you know, the more people who have tablets and smartphones and the bigger the smartphones get and the easier it is to read on those, like the more shit will, you know, will catch up to that. Yeah. Because right now the only, the re- the only real method of distribution used to be, uh, the, you know your computer and now there's so many more and because comic book creators and comic book companies refuse to work with video game consoles for whatever unknown reason um you can't get comics on your xbox or on your ps Which uh, is playstation ridiculous that's mind-boggling yeah, yeah, yeah right? it's, it's, it's like how did like no one fucking think of that i'm sure they did cons- think of that there's a lot I'm of sure cross-pollination we want new fans we want new readers 
Well, look the, at DC's, just, like, one of their best-selling books right now is... Based uh, on a video yeah, game, an it, awful, awful video game. Is, is uh, awful. what is it, Injustice? Injustice, but the, and then video Injustice game. Comics sells really well. Yeah, and it's, so the, it's got to be those comic so book well, fans. I, it's yeah, got to be those video game I, fans I buying it. Read, it's but, why yeah. uh, Gears of War was selling huge oh, amounts, yeah, because yeah. they were available in GameStop. Absolutely. Which is like, yeah, well, when you put something out there for more than fucking like, four people to buy, they buy it. I remember when uh, yeah. when City of Heroes first came out, all subscribers got the comic book yeah. that went along with the game in the mail. So I yeah. like the first 13 issues of that from when the game first came out. Yeah. I mean, there's always been like a huge amount of crossover. Like Almost everyone I know that reads comics also plays video games. Yeah. Like It's rare well, to get someone who I doesn't. I mean, it's even beyond that. There's the idea that if you sell a product in one store, in one fucking place... You're going to reach a limited audience. Oh, definitely. If you sell it in 50 stores in 50 different places, you're going to reach a lot more people. What I've always and said about comic people books. People that don't know they're interested in shit will try your shit and become interested in it. Absolutely. Well, it's this true. This is the very basis even, of this is like what drug dealers do. It's true even with our podcast. It's yeah. on our website and it's on iTunes and it's on YouTube and it's on the Comics Podcast Network yeah, and it's and, on the Outhousers. And no one's like, listening. It's why no, no one at all. <laughs> Not a guys. single goddamn person. <laughs> if you're hearing this, you are probably a ghost. You're the you're only one listening. Either, they could be bots. They could Go be find Haley Joe Osment. Wait a minute. Dwayne McDuffie? What? Oh, in peace, sir. I think that's going to be that's going to be a reference to something that's not even on. It's the not episode. on. I'm not putting that on the episode. It doesn't matter. That's people will just be like, "What the fuck are they talking about?" We didn't say anything unkind. We said that he was in comic book heaven. We but said we that he said awesome. some unkind things about episode other six creators. Of comic book <laughs> hell. Unkind things that we wish Dwayne McDuffie's ghost would do to other people in the comic book industry, and we won't name names. We really need to put together an episode of just some of the shit that we say. Before we actually start the episode, we were going to. I was my bad. I'll take the heat for that. I had to. I had to be a good house boyfriend. Yeah. To my uh, to my sugar mama. I do. I do. Yeah. So there there was one other thing that I wanted to say about the private eye. Yes. Um, something that was interesting to me is when the internet kind of first came up in the 90s cuz now like a lot more people are on the ne- are on the internet they're on their devices they have facebook yeah. like you want your identity to be yeah. your identity and that's very like closely ch- tied to who you are yeah. when the internet first came out there was this kind of ideology of this is a completely separate identity from who you are in the real world. Like you oh, need yeah. your internet handle right. that people know you by, and that is its own identity. There was definitely a lot of anonymity back when we were kids on the internet, for sure. And when Google was like, no, you have to have your real name on your Google Plus account, there was a huge amount of pushback because there are a lot of people out there who are transgender or you know gay or any number of other things where – they don't necessarily feel comfortable having one identity because they have a certain identity at work and mm-hmm. they have a certain identity with their friends and they have a certain identity with their family or they feel like on the internet they can be free from their physical body and can present an identity that is more true to the person that they see inside their own head. Well, also just out of safety too, like those are groups of people who have traditionally received a lot of hate yeah. in the past and still do and unfortunately like sometimes you just can't like i was doing uh a show for a while that we never put out and it didn't go anywhere but with a female friend of mine and i was like oh well we'll just those our real names and she was like i don't want to do that because she was afraid to put her name out there and i was yeah. like well y- you know like that makes that makes a lot of sense because I never thought about that because if I get death threats, I'm just going to laugh at you and tell you to fuck off. But <laughs> like some people don't react like that to death threats. Like some yeah. people, it affects them, you know. And Absolutely. There are a lot of, uh, you know, people that do what we do, but because they're gay or because they're women, like they get hate mail and we don't. And so. Which is fucking awful. Well, it is, it awful. is awful. It's absolutely fucking tragic. And that's why a lot of the internet anonymity that still exists is right. because there is hate in the world. Right. And my, my, my point is, is that there are those people for whom their internet pseudonym is more them. Oh yeah. Than the, the identity that they have when they're walking down the street. Oh, definitely. And I think that there is something interesting going on in this comic where everybody's wearing 
disguises, like they're really uh, anonymous, but on this other level, the identity that they choose to disguise themselves with says something about who they are. Oh, definitely. And maybe a truer identity than who they are underneath that mask. Absolutely. Yeah, like yeah he, when um, Taj <laughs> first comes in yeah. and she's wearing the tiger mask and he's like, oh, you're one of those furry people. Yeah. Like, there are obviously people who are wearing a mask right. that makes them more themselves. Right. And I thought that that was something that was really interesting that just kind of flows under the surface of this comic. No, and I, may, oh, you may not notice right away. That's what drew me to it in the first place was I think if everybody had just been walking around wearing their normal faces, but it was in this world where people were actually, because they were deprived of that online persona where they could do and say what they wanted to, what they really felt, mm -hmm. They had to do it in real life, and I thought that's kind. Of, that's what really drew me to this because I think that's the coolest part of the whole thing. And I think also, it's interesting going through the book, looking at all of the costumes that the different characters wear, and go, yeah. "What does this say about who they are?" Yeah. Well, it was something that wasn't explored in another comic that I thought it really could have been, which is the book. Um, oh God, what is the name of this book? It was made into a movie with Bruce, Will Bruce Willis and uh, oh, surrogates. Yeah. Um, something about surrogates is like you stayed at home while your surrogate went out and lived life for you. And something that was really interesting about that is, well, like that doesn't have to fucking look like you at all. Yeah. Like that could be anything. Like what yeah. if you got to choose what you looked like? And, you know, a lot of the world would be a different place if you could just pretend to be somebody else. Absolutely. And uh, I think, that again, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's something that's insanely interesting about this book. And something interesting that I'm seeing more and more in anime and manga that mm -hmm. isn't really happening in the U S is that there are a lot more that are set inside MMORPGs. Yeah. And a large part of that is, the characters that you see on the comic or on the screen, that is an avatar being represented, like that is representing somebody else that you don't necessarily see through the entire series. Well, it was something that was brought up in the documentary uh, Second Life or Other Life oh, yeah. about MMOs that uh, I found really fascinating. That documentary is insane and go watch it because there's some crazy shit that goes on in that. But... Um, one of the guys that they focus on, he's paralyzed from the waist down and something that he, maybe even from the neck down, like he's in a wheelchair and something that he says about MMOs is they, they grant him the freedom to feel what everybody else feels like when they first meet someone, which is they just treat him like he was anybody else. Right. And that's, that like makes me want to tear up because that's sad. No, because, I think oh, that's you should always, thing. you know, like it's treat people with acceptance. I mean, but the, the internet is a great equalizer. It is a great equalizer. Like sometimes there's, or, there's well, bad shit. Well, I should shit. say it can be a great well, equalizer. There are awful, awful acts perpetrated against people. Well, that, there definitely are, but, but there are assholes in real life. Too, yeah, exactly. So like, I mean, it doesn't, that's true. It doesn't. It's not worse than. Those ads. The, the thing is, is that they are being their true selves. And sometimes I don't want to see their true selves because they're a dickhead. <laughs> How, and, their true self and they is would not dick. say those things to me or to other people in real life because it's right. not acceptable. But no, at the same time, yeah, you're right. It can be a great equalizer, and it can really like if you meet someone online and they send you a message and you say something to them. Like, you have no perception of what they are actually, what they look like, what gender they are, yeah. how old they are. And like, in that way, it's an amazing equalizer and a great. I just think that that's there's a cool part of that. And, you no, know, absolutely. If you could design... That actually reminds me. Um, I was reading an, a WoW article um, about this uh, a blind person who plays mm -hmm. WoW, and through the use of a special keyboard and voice over IP, he's able to play WoW and interact with people that don't know that he's blind. How does he see what's going on in the game? He doesn't. He uses a special keyboard and voice over. So it just like tells vocal. him what. It, it's like um, you just got totally people will <laughs> tell him things that are going on if and he will react to them quadrants, with his keyboard. Then you could do that. You could just that's be like... A, that's really cool. That is really cool. I want to see how that works because that sounds well, amazing. They, there are people who have developed a special sensor for blind people where it actually attaches to your tongue uh -huh. and certain like elements on the sensor will activate different areas on your tongue like a little electric shock. And blind people can actually use this to create like a three-dimensional picture of what's around them. 
Wow. Uh, no, and I imagine that it would be on. very trivial to take a device like that and hook it up to a virtual world where it's reacting to the virtual world like it was a real world. Well, it would yeah. actually probably be easier because it's the virtual world is right. data. It just yeah. Had, yeah, it well, just has to send it the data the for what the ventrilo to tell him what's going on. Oh, okay. Um, that is very interesting. But it's actually funny how remarkably easy it is to take one part of, like, one sensory element of the brain, like hearing or taste. Yeah. And reroute it to another element, like vision. Well, right. it all goes to the same place in your brain, so. Which is why we were talking about synesthesia the other day. <laughs> yeah. That's why everything gets crossed, because it all is one portion of your brain that takes care of all of it. Yeah, I wish I could, I could hear color. That'd be crazy. Also, try drugs. <laughs> yeah. like, so acid's far, great for that. So far, none of them have let me hear color in the way that never is been brought to by meth. <laughs> They've never done it in the way that the great composers who had synesthesia will like describe it. As. No, that's true. Like, it's, that's true. It's never been like that. Or listening to a chef that has synesthesia is really incredible too. Yeah, because it's just like not only do they do they hear color, but they also hear color in a way that other people with synesthesia wouldn't be able to hear color because they yeah, are composers and musicians like they are the might... best at what they do and what in the field that they have synesthesia in yeah. which is insane in and some of some people some of them might interpret uh auditory data as visual data or well there's a composer who talks about he thought everyone had synesthesia because if no one told you that yeah. you can't hear <laughs> color, like why would you think that other people can't hear? Like Absolutely. that would be insane to be like, Absolutely. only I can hear things. This sounds like, a little red, doesn't it? And so uh, he I, thought I that know. the lights in the theater went down so you could hear the colors better, huh. which is like a beautiful thought in and of what itself. I was like, that's fantastic. That's really uh, but you know, like it, it would be, you. I'll never be able to experience it the same way, even with massive amounts of drugs. Like no, it won't, it no, won't do like the same that. thing. No. Um, so everyone at home, it's not going to make you, you know, hear, hear color in the same way. Like, yeah, <laughs> you should have told me sooner. Why were you oh, rambling? Uh, but the side note, this book makes me want to live in a world in which I can wear full oh, knight's God, armor yes. to work. And that's fine. Like, that's what I want. I want that more than anything. Because the guy that, like, is the bodyguard of the costume shop is just, like, in a fucking knight's costume. Yep. I love it. I think I would just... Get a giant bear head. <laughs> that would be <laughs> sweet. Around. Yeah, no, it'd be awesome. And I like, want awesome. actually bear back legs. So like, I want it to be bear tar, which is the yeah, mythical creature I'm I down. created, which is the ba- body of a bear, and then from where the bear's head is is the top half of a <laughs> man. I think that works. I have a drawing of it in the studio, but it's oh, not a centaur, right but now. with a bear body. Yeah, instead of a horse body. Okay, I, I, I'm with you. I'm no, down. that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I couldn't cover this up because this is fucking gorgeous, but I'd get like a <laughs> Joseph in the Technicolor raincoat or some shit. I'd oh, get yeah. like a the most like flamboyant fucking jacket you could ever see. Like yeah, that's what I would do like if we had 90, that kind of tech. Like a 90s. Full of hologram chromium fucking like jacket. A, like a 90s. I think I like have like one for you, man. On you get it with a bunch of like lady death covers. Yeah. Together, like all the chaos it's comics actually, covers from the 90s yeah. that were all chromium and it's shit. Like, it's like Jubilees. I'd have Jubilees coat. earrings. Oh, yeah. I could straight up have the one that they full on say Jubilee. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And we fucking don't. like leopard, leopard like leggings or something. I so want to like, see you wear this now. Yeah, know, Next right? time we go out downtown, like, so, so, I know some what combination you're of like wearing. like Rod Stewart in like bad '90s comics and like Cher and, and '80s and hair metal. Yeah, oh yeah, God, that's beautiful. <laughs> That's, That's what's up. That'd be my outfit. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> a bald guy with '80s hair metal. <laughs> no, no, the, the, the like the clothing that they oh, wore, right? Yeah. Like okay. '80s hair metal. You would know you know carry a mic like down with 27 vest. bandanas tied around? It does make it. me you, kind you, of you, sad you, sometimes you. that so much stuff today is just really kind of plain. Clothes are very plain. Yeah. Buildings are very plain. Like they used to make shit like ornamental. Well. Yeah, archite- I mean, like, some architecture is really cool, but a lot of it's just, like, super functional. It's just like, oh, it's a fucking square building. Kill yourself. And like, I the- get bummed every time I have to dress up because every single lady is wearing a different kind of oh, dress yeah. and every single dude is wearing the exact same suit. Yeah, it's sad. It's boring. And I, it, whenever you saw the future, you know, when it was the 80s and the 90s for us as kids, and it was like... In the year 2000, <laughs> the year that Marty McFly goes to the future, it was it passed. It, no, 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 it's 2015. It's next year. It's next year. I thought it was 2015. 2014. No, no it's not. Okay. that's a fucking meme from the internet that lies. All right, well, it's it was 1955. Like then it was 30 years later in 1985. Then it was 30 years later in 2015. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, however, like 
we're no fucking closer to that puffy oh, vest God, no. that dries itself and the Nikes that the wearing two ties the at the same time. The Nike, Nike yeah. did come out and say that they're going to make the self-lacing Nike for cool. special edition for the year of that movie. So yeah, that's cool. Legit. But yeah. dude, like everything was just like crazy and, and everyone was wearing ridiculous clothing because it was the 80s future and everyone wore crazy clothes the in the 80s. The 80s future is one of my be- favorite futures. Oh, it's no, it's a, a great good future. future. It's a good future. But now here we are and it's... Not much has changed, especially men's fashion. Men's fashion changes. Well, like men's fashion has not been stagnant for for uh, a while. I yeah. actually, I, I, um, I, I got into this conversation years ago with this this guy, and we we seriously talked for like a half hour, forty five minutes about just how boring and stale. He was wearing the most amazing pair of like aqua colored shoes, and I'm mm. like, your shoes are fucking amazing. And we talked for like a half hour, 45 minutes about how just flat and stagnant men's fashion is and how you can't yeah. go out wearing like an electric blue suit with a fucking well, like aqua well, shirt and I red can. shoes. Wait, and why, it's like because, not? well, it's, can. you can, but like try finding that shit and then try not spending a, like a fortune on it. And also because not they make having it, but... everyone come up to you on the street and be like, dude, what are you wearing? Yeah, it's like, like, I don't ask you when I you're mean, about your shitty clothes. Yeah. yeah. Like, I figure, you know, Baby they gap. got to wear pastels yeah. <laughs> in the fucking 80s. I want to wear, like, big, bold colors and shit. I want to wear a Dude, fucking I, floral print suit. I have a, have I have a we, pair of orange shorts that I really like. Have we talked about Gem and the Holograms? Oh, on the show. Oh, we have God. on the show. We, we have on the times. show. Uh, show I'm not favorite. sure if we have or not, but Joe and I were watching TV one day. We were just flipping around on Netflix, and yeah. he went past Gem and the Holograms. And I was like, we got to fucking watch Gem and the Holograms, obviously. Yeah. And it was incredible. It yeah. was. And one of the things I loved the best about that show is just how crazy the fashion is. Like, oh, every yeah. single character has an awesome design. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, I heard someone else say hologram seriously. Really? In a recording the <laughs> really? other day. No, like, that's, I think that's an actual pronunciation of it. Uh, like, it is. I think actually. it's holograms, but I don't. Mind. No, because it was like in a real, like scientific thing from from the early nineties, and they said like hologram, mature, and he mature. said, "Yeah," and he said hologram, and I was like, "What?" Because I lost my mind. Because all I can think of is I gem think and as the long holograms. as we can agree that gem is truly outrageous. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, are we done with Private Eye? I think so. Fuck Private you, Joe. Eye. Podcast canceled. Yeah. Fuck no. That was good. That was quality <laughs> shit right I'm there. I'm done with you. Anyways, All right. you keep saying Let's that. Let's move on Manics. to recommendations. Please save us. What would? What should we read? I actually brought one I'm really excited about, so if you don't pick uh, it, I'm, I am, I'm actually going to cry this time, for real. I usually bring something I'm kind of mildly into. I have been cracking oh, up. Oh, my God. I'm Doctor Strange. I'm so oh. in love. I have such a man crush. I can't even, like, dude, I'm losing my mind. Uh, I went through my Marvel Unlimited subscription today, and I was looking through, like, Amazing Spider-Man and, like, all these random books, like, looking for Doctor Strange on the cover. That's how, like, hard my addiction is now. Because I already read all the regular shit, and I'm like, I need the, re- where's the rest of it? I know, Doctor Strange is everywhere in the Marvel Universe. Go watch that. Did you watch that? Thing, I haven't the yet. Pilot? Okay, there's a pilot for the Doctor I, Strange TV show on YouTube. I, I will see it. Watch. I know I will, but I'm kind of like afraid because I horrible. know it's going to be bad. But I, but this I I didn't even. This is out of print now. That what I'm holding here, since you can't see it at home, it's Doctor Strange versus Dracula, the Montesi formula. Uh, it collects uh, Tomb of Dracula 44, Doctor Strange 14, and then it skips all the way to 58 through 62. This is a volume two, so this is like. Uh, early 80s stuff at this point. Uh, you got guys like Gene Colan in here, Roger Stern doing some writing. So classic, classic stuff. I hate when Dracula is in the X-Men. I hate when like they use Frankenstein. Uh, the supernatural stuff with the, the, the superhero stuff doesn't work for me. Uh, but this... What about, what about Doctor- Blade? It works with Blade, it works but, but, with the Midnight Blade Suns. Blade always viewed as more supernatural. <laughs> yeah, what about yeah. the I Son of Satan? Satan? Blade was there. Yeah, but like, Blade always viewed as more supernatural. And so like... This story to me, uh, without giving too much away, there's a story in here where Doctor Strange has to dip into the black arts and out black art fucking Dracula. And I just lost my shit. I lost my shit completely. Nice. And, and like, Dracula's such a vain motherfucker, you know, he, like, you know, is almost getting smoked. He's like, oh, good thing I, uh, you know, had to... I mean, it looked like I went out like a bitch, but really what I did, right? Is like, you know, it's like, oh, Dracula. Even, like, almost getting, like, just totally killed by Doctor Strange. You still can't admit that you got whooped. Like, I don't know. I love this book. I lost my mind when I found it. Because uh, I'm on the hunt for Doctor Strange. And a lot of his stuff's out of print and really hard to find. Uh, but this was just a really great story. I love Doctor Strange. I only have like three of the trades so far, but uh, 
Uh, yes. Soon you will have all of them. Oh, I will have them all. I will have them all soon. I'm already. <laughs> uh, I, I got a whole thing bookmarked on eBay. I got all these books I'm looking for. But I. You've like, been talking about this for like a couple weeks. I've been. I, I only got into Doctor Strange like three months ago or something, so it's a recent addiction. But I've like, like, I, you know, I've Have read him in the context. Have you not on the Midnight Suns stuff yet? I haven't. Yeah. Midnight Suns is the it's team good, that good. he's on. It's the team that has Doctor Strange. Like, like Johnny Suns, Blaze, right? It's got, like, Johnny, yeah, it's Midnight got Ghost Suns Riders. was the the big uh, Marvel uh, Marvel Magic crossover yeah. where Blade got the Book of the Vashanti and was yeah. like oh. gaining the powers of everybody. I'm getting hard right now even thinking about it. Like, yeah. It's like totally up your alley. Good. I it's know. Got, it's Damn. Blade. He's like walking it's... along at one point. He's like half Ghost Rider. He's got like a flaming crab, a crab claw on his sword. Nobody can beat him. And That sounds amazing. Yeah, Midnight Suns is a cool Nice. I gotta check series. it out. A lot um, of that early 90s stuff again at the time I was only in X-Men so I, like, this, I have a vague understanding. This of art is awesome too. This reminds me of the first books I was reading when I got into comics. Things like uh, Wonder Man on the Avengers and whatnot. It's it's pretty gorgeous. I'm gonna give you a hot tip. Never ever read the early nineties Secret Defenders. Where Doctor bad. Strange is putting together like random teams of people. It looks bad. Yeah. It is god. Just just going off the covers, awful. it looks bad. It I is found so those, are the, bad. those are the ones you've been posting, right? With the where yeah. it's got like uh John Travolta hair. Yeah, there's some really bad. Yeah, there's some really bad stuff. Uh, that there. was there was actually a Twisted Toy Fair theater where Doctor Strange was going around to all the teams, and he's like, "But you guys are one of my secret defender teams." Oh well, uh, <laughs> Giffen and Demetrius did. Uh, it wasn't Secret Defenders. It was just Defenders. That last mini series, right? Yeah. Like Joseph Five or yeah, something. Yeah, like it was yeah. a while ago, but that yeah. was fucking hilarious. That was funny. Yeah. And Kevin McGuire did the art, and it was like you know the dream team from. Uh, the uh, 80s Justice League, Justice League International, yeah. and it was fucking hilarious. That's where Surfer was just kind of like hanging out with Surfer <laughs> the whole fucking, time, just contemplating life The and shit. fucking yeah. Hulk calls, yeah. Bruce Banner calls Namor the Little Mermaid at one point, <laughs> and Namor goes on to finish what he's saying, and then he's like, wait a minute, did you just call me the Little Mermaid? And then he like punches him through a wall, <laughs> and then Banner hulks out, and Doctor Strange is just going, what the fuck did I do? What did I do? What did I do? It's great. It's hilarious. Nice. Excellent. He's, uh, Sam, uh, po- podcast friend, Sam Lucino, was and I were talking about how much we want the West Coast Avengers to come back now that there's oh a bunch God, of Marvel yeah, characters seriously. on the West Coast. But now that you guys are talking about this, like, I want the Midnight Suns to come back. Like, so <laughs> bad. Like, I want, because Blade doesn't have an ongoing anymore. No, Blade has been on since Straczynski. Uh... So Daredevil's moving out to L.A. What, spoilers? Or... For like two months ago, almost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, Kate Bishop is Kate out Bishop. there too, yeah. being a PI. Yep. Yeah. PI lawyer team yeah. up. They'll also uh, who else oh, yeah. just went out to the west? Somebody else. Is, oh, Moon Knight. Moon Knight's Moon on the moved, West yeah. Coast. Is he? I'm pretty sure. And well, being yeah. written by Warren Ellis. Yeah. I knew he was really being good. written by Warren Ellis. I thought he was in New York. Is he back in New York? Because Bendis moved him to LA. I have no. And I they guess they don't identify really, the city. They haven't they said yet yeah. yeah, where. At least I just know the issue ends with him going out to Stately Wayne Manor. Yeah. To go talk to, oh, spoilers, to go talk to a guy with, like, a fucking bird skeleton. <laughs> that issue was awesome. That, was so that issue was awesome. I really liked it. Um, but so, yeah, there's, like, guys on the West Coast, and uh, the new Warriors are, like, somewhere near the West Coast, and there's not X-Men on the West aren't Coast the, anymore. So. Aren't the new no, Warriors, yeah, no, like, anymore. all over Kinetic? <laughs> No, just, like just little, ago, little, little bits and pieces. I think X-Men are in fucking Canada the now, shit. No, yeah. the, only one of the new Warriors died in Civil War. It was, but uh, all of them died Nitro. before Civil War. Nitro killed all of them, didn't he? Like, yeah, they no. exploded. Yeah, they they exploded. No, none of them died. Really? Not one. No, it was a bunch oh. of kids that got killed, and, and uh, Speedball uh, turned into Penance because he, he got Yeah, but I thought he was but... the only one, like no. Namorita and Namorita died later. Um, Earlier. Ish. I thought she died before that. Maybe. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Speedball is still there. Obviously, Nova went on to Annihilation. Nova going. was already out of the New Warriors yeah, by the time point. that happened. Yeah. He was, was out the, in space when that was all going it on. It was yeah. the, it was Debris, or Debris. And, um, Debra. It's pronounced Debra. Uh, uh, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> Debra. <laughs> Anyways, God damn it, Debra. <laughs> God damn it, Debra. Um, She's on the team. Uh, no, but then, uh, fucking, what's the, uh, uh Dark... What is Dark Hawk? Dark Hawk. He um, had his own I, whole mini series after that, so he lived. You through. said I love that, Dark Hawk. and even I know I'm like one of five people that knows who Dark Hawk is, and uh, I immediately thought of the Silverhawks theme song. That show uh, was the shit. That what's show was awesome the shit. is if you actually read the original Dark Hawk series, there were more than one of him. 
There was a bunch of dark hawks. Oh, yeah, well, that's, because, that's yeah, what the miniseries was... Post Civil War is about too. Oh, really? Well, it yeah, because awesome. his brother was like posing as him for a while too. I was getting him a Knights of Ashford confused for a second. I was like, oh yeah, dark hawk. Yeah, totally different guy. All right, so, so Joe, Joe anyway. what did you bring? Oh, God. I I wrestled with it a lot because there's one there's it, a web comic I want to talk about. It was tough. Was it hard to, pick to beat? One. Did you beat him? Did you I pin did. him in three rounds? I did. Good. Uh, oh. I used the full Nelson. Oh, that's that's more than a half Nelson. That's twice was, as much. That's as twice as, as much about it. <laughs> so I think uh, after much uh, going back and forth, that I'm going to bring back something I recommended about six weeks ago. I think, which was uh, the Frank book. Oh, nice. Um, which uh, there seemed to be some interest in. But uh, yeah. uh, in case you haven't heard that episode, I'll pitch it again. Uh, Frank is a cat-like creature that lives in a place called the Unifactor. And the Unifactor basically provides for all of Frank's needs. And all it asks in return is that he like experience it. And it's in, they're wordless comics for the most part. Uh, they're incredibly surreal. Jim Woodring is... Aside from being a cartoonist's cartoonist, uh, he is very, he does, he, he's very good at not being heavy handed with his metaphor. So one of the things I really like about Frank is it's a book that you can read and really dig for. And there's really no like kind of, oh no, clearly you're missing this. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, I think it'll lead to a really good exchange of ideas. Um, the art is fantastic. Uh, there's definitely some parts that are a little disturbing, but I think they add man to the pig. whole. Yeah, there's man pig. There's a whole cast of characters. There's man pig and uh, uh, push paw and pup shaw, which are these kind of like almost. Like I only, I've only read cat. like maybe the first twenty pages as we were listening to Jim Woodring speak, and I found man pig horrifying. Yeah, and he, I think he's supposed to be. Uh, there's one, these there's are a, like anthropomorphized animals in the style of like <clears throat> kind of. Like Looney Tunes. Frank is kind, kind of, of like a Mickey Mouse looking character. Yeah, yeah. Other characters are for. less cartoony. And the, the yeah. great thing about Frank is that uh, it's all, it's been a, it's normally in black and white. And the first Frank comics were dev cartoons were definitely like uh, were definitely done in black and white. And uh, like everything from his name and what he looked like was kind of Jim Woodring told gave told had this idea and he would talk to people about it and they'd be like this woman was like. Oh, his name has to be Frank, and he has to be a cat. And then he told somebody else, and they were like, yeah, he's got to be this tall and have purple fur. And so even though the majority of the drawings are in black and white, he still kind of used that in his uh, in, in some of the color drawings. But I think it's a great book, and I think that um, uh, it's, it's interesting to read. I think it's... I think it's a, a, I think well, it's being, a masterpiece. Being wordless too, like you yeah. get to infer a lot in in a book, um, and so I've always found wordless comics to be really interesting for that too. Because Absolutely, like you're, you end up adding a lot to it from yourself. Yeah, you know, you you end up putting a lot of yourself into the work. So, and I think it's not quite as abstract as Tale of Sand, which I think we kind of had a hard time. I think really getting at anything from. But uh, I speak for yourself. I well, know. I mean, I know what I got from it, but I think, I think there was some. I yeah, we, we I, took different things away from it. Yeah, well, and yeah. so and I think as you, as you will with a wordless comic, I think. I think with the, with Frank, it's they're not quite as. I think while they're more surreal, they're not quite as abstract. Hmm. If that makes any sense, not and really. But okay, no, I get you. Yeah, I mean the uh, the yeah. That's that's what I'm. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right. Yeah, that's the ticket. Yeah, yeah, there, Pally. I'll see you in the alley. I'll back. Uh, you got so your heater you on you. I'm done. Cade. I'm done with you, Joe. Cade, what would you like us to? Read? Cade, how many times do you think we can get Chard to quit the podcast in one episode? <sighs> so what are we on? Like ten? I, I don't have lost, I lost count. track, and I don't care. So what are you what are you recommending this week? Okay, so I'm recommending something that I recommended before, and this time I have a Wikipedia helping me pitch it so that oh, I nice. um, can actually describe it properly. Okay, so the series is called Hard Time, and it's uh, written by Steve Gerber and Mary Screenies, and uh, with art by Brian Hurt, and it's. Um, about a 15-year-old boy who was involved in a high school shooting scare gone wrong, which costs several students their lives. 
And so he's sent to prison uh, for 50 to life, which is coincidentally the name of the first volume. And it's two volumes long. It's 12 issues. Um, and while in prison, he manifests a superhero, a superpower called the Kichare that appears as a physical man- manifestation of his alter ego, alter ego while he sleeps or is otherwise unconscious. And, uh, and while he's in prison, one of the older gentlemen in there helps him try to develop this power and dramatic hijinks in the prison ensue, sometimes with hilarious results, sometimes with very dramatic results. You never quite know where it's going. And Steve Gerber is uh, an amazing writer, uh, most popular for co-creating Howard the Duck, as well as some of the characters on Guardians of Galaxy. Nice. So I think it's a great book. Uh, I recently got the second trade, which was issues uh, 7 through 12. And so I wanted to pitch all 12 issues nice. and talk about them. Excellent. Nice. All right. I also have a redemption pick, although oh, it was the first thing I ever pitched like a year and a half ago. So I feel like it's kind of had its time yeah. and, and it's ready to come back. So uh, this is a comic by Ed Brubaker, David Aja, and the man, the myth, oh, the legend, ooh. butt stuff, werewolf, yeah, also Fraction. known as Matt Fraction. Uh, and this is the Immortal Iron Fist from about 2006. Such a good yeah. one. It was kind of a, was a revitalization, much. relaunch of the character. Uh, the first trade, I'm pitching the first two trades. The first mm-hmm. one is the last Iron Fist story. And it's not... The last Iron Fist story, it's the Iron Fist previous, the one before Danny Rand, who nobody actually knew existed before this. He comes back, and he's this guy called Orson Randall, and he was the Iron Fist of, like, World War One, and he channels his chi through pistols and can do all these things that Danny Rand never knew about because he has the Book of the Iron Fist, and Danny Rand never got to read that. Well, yeah, he's just and so it. yeah, it's kind of this like weird revitalization where Danny Rand is learning all these things he never knew before and connecting with the previous Iron Fist and the previous Iron Fists going yeah. back through history. It oh, does a oh, great job of building goodness. a legacy. Oh God, into this that is such character. a good fucking run. God it is it. such a good run. It's yeah. a great story. The art is beautiful. Uh, and in the second story, it's called uh, the Capital Cities of Heaven. Right. And it's a martial arts tournament between the seven capital cities of heaven because each of them has an immortal weapon. Right. Danny Rand, the Iron Fist, is the immortal weapon of Kun Loon. Mm-hmm. There are six others. Right. And they get to have a big old fight, and it's really cool in the very, in the very old tradition of martial arts tournaments. Yeah, and in a way that, like, if you ever watched Dragon Ball as a kid and the <clears> world <throat> martial arts tournament that they would go to and, like, all these different fighting styles schools of fighting styles would go fight like it very much reminded me of that but yeah it was serious instead of being a you know a bunch of fart jokes and bo smell right jokes. um well, and the other actually, immortal yeah. weapons are super cool all they of them are. are really interesting they have their own fighting styles mm-hmm. if you read hawkeye which was by just matt fraction and david aja you kind of have a little bit of a sense of how it's paced and what the art looks like. Like there's the same kind of lighthearted humor mixed in with really awesome action. Yeah. More action in this than in Hawkeye though. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's very, it's oh, yeah, very yeah, heavily yeah, yeah. pulling on its martial arts tradition. Yeah. Well, this, this I've loved when I was uh, younger and I first was reading comics. One of the things I would always read cause I could get it at my local grocery store was MCP Marvel comics presents. And there was usually like a Daredevil story and there was usually an Iron Fist or an Iron a story in the back and I loved I loved the concept of Iron Fist but nobody seemed to want to do anything with him and then I saw this and I was like oh my god it's got to be good and I read it and I yeah it was yeah, just the, one of those The best way that I can put it the way that Daredevil is depicted in the most recent Mark Wade run, and I can't remember who the artist is off at the top of my head. It's Chris Samney for the later stuff. Omni. But it's, but uh, it's uh, the, um, Paolo Rivera for the Yes, stuff. Paolo Rivera. Yeah. They do the such a good job of depicting the way that Daredevil perceives the world around him. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
And I feel like this comic does the same thing with Iron Fist, showing the way that he is thinking about and interacting with the world, where he just kind of has this constant martial arts sense where he's estimating things. I would agree with that. And also, this did uh, something that the Marvel Universe doesn't really have a lot of which is a legacy of characters like it is building in a legacy of characters much like they would do for a Ghost Rider later yeah. but um that the fact that he is not the first Iron Fist and not by right. a long stretch yeah. like this is the most ancient Marvel legacy character by a fucking well, ton Well this was the thing Maybe that I not kind of... the most ancient but certainly very ancient of, yeah. Well there I mean the, like there's the White Tiger Who's the avatar of the saber toothed tiger god? Well, how many iterations? I'm not sure how many iterations okay. there have been, but that I mean, it goes back to prehistoric times. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. I mean, like he's he's one of them for sure. I mean, like he the fact that there are so many iterations of the Iron Fist right. is something that was introduced in this series. So. Yeah, and this was this was I think when Marvel started really paying more attention. This is the comic that really brought me back to Marvel in a strong yeah, way. Yeah, I have to say. And, you know, it's, I think, when I fell in love with Mad Fraction, which uh, which continues. He, he continues to... Uh, butt Stuff Werewolf. Butt Stuff Werewolf. I, is he going to be at the uh, Emerald Yeah, City? he's always there. Um, I'm going to bring these to him and then, like... Portland or whatever. When I fell in love with Mad Fraction is when our eyes met across the con room floor and... Well, I mean, I he does looked, have soulful eyes. I just looked deep into his soul, and uh, you knew. And I just and, knew and it, it, was, it was it was love. over. It was love. Love. Apparently, over. these editions are not signed by Matt Fraction, so I'm definitely going to bring him with me to Emerald City. No, I, I am. I, yeah, I've got those hardcovers too. I'm like, I think I man, brought. Like, I need to get mine signed. I think I brought it last year, and like, just did not have time. Yeah. Or my bag was too full, and I pulled them out at the last second. I keep second. trying to find an excuse to get rid of the ones I have, so I can buy the omnibus. But I can't justify it. Well, Omnibus is out of print and super expensive, man. What's the problem? Oh, is it? Oh, it's crazy. They have a new um, uh, large format trade paper bag that's all 16, and uh, and then all the, uh, there's some, some one shots and stuff in there, so it's more like, you know, 20 issues. Right, like right. Uh, and that's like, I think like 40 bucks or something. Really killer value amount. That's what I would go with. But yeah, and, they, they did a hardcover Omnibus that's yeah, like I don't, going yeah. for 200 I bucks now. I don't think you get the single hardcovers anymore, but you no, can get them in paperback. No, they're all out of print now. And even the individual, tra- but yeah, even the individual uh, trade, Trains. like the, the volume you have, they're all out of print. But yeah. they, they recently, within the last like, three months or so came out with a, a large format trade. Of and that's all of the all Brubaker of Fraction. D- D- Brubaker Fraction run. But then yeah. Fraction continues the series after Brubaker leaves, and I think that it's equally strong. Yeah, like, I, I have the third volume. I don't like it quite as much. I feel like the first two strong stories are the strongest. Well, yeah, I think I read, I don't know, I went for like six or seven volumes. There's five Fraction, There's right? five volumes. The first 16 were, yeah, like Brubaker, and then uh, it was Dwayne Saritsky, I believe, that did... Um, I guess twenty or twenty one through I think they only did through like twenty yeah. or something. So there's there's like two more collections after the, the, the three yeah. that they had originally got in. But that's all right. that Matt Fraction wrote those? No, it's uh, the the volume four and five are Dwayne Swordsky and But uh, when did Fraction because Fraction, Fraction wrote the, they did the first He wrote six, the third one and that's it. They, I think so, yeah. Yeah. But Brubaker might have written some of that in there too. I gotta mm. look. Anyway, it's funny because volume one says Brewbreaker faction, Fraction, and volume two says Fraction Brewbreaker. Well, hey, they alternated on plot and dialogue or something. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that works. I, I was just saying that. I was, and when um, I get them signed at Emerald City, I'm going to have him sign them, Butt Stuff Werewolf. Nice. Sounds good. Because that's the best Twitter handle that has ever existed. Yeah. I always like finding people's uh, internet online handles. I've not, I've definitely not said this on the show before, but. Um, we play. We were playing Xbox Live one time, and I found my favorite internet handle of all time, which was "balls in my butt." <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> skims under the Xbox Live radar, and they don't think that's offensive. <laughs> what was the one that Kirby found? Was it Hot Dad's Five Life? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, what did you bring, Charlie? I have ElfQuest put me in a weird mood. After it does that. I read it, no, I was like, no, yeah, I just want to read some different, really different comics. So I've been reading nothing but French graphic novels for oh, like a yeah. week and a half. Um, <laughs> so I'm rereading the the In Call, which is the Moebius Illustrated book that Ooh. he's famous for. But I'm not bringing that. 
Because we just read a science fiction book, and we by no means need to read another science fiction detective story. I think that Mobius is something you should read and never talk about to anyone. Really? Yeah. You don't like him? It's not that I don't like him. It's that I don't want to talk about it. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm loving the hell out of that series again, like I did the first time. Uh, but this you didn't watch Gandahar with me and Joe. I did not watch oh, Gandahar. Oh God, the Light Years. I'm gonna this, start having a seizure. Was that written by Moebius or just? <laughs> no, it was. Um, I think all the character designs were done by. I think yeah. Like, by, uh, is it not I'm Moebius? Is it Moebius? I think it's Moebius. Blue boobies. That's bad. Uh, it was produced anyway, by he, did, he also did most of the, or was in, was the inspiration for most of the design on the Fifth Element too. So yeah, dude was influential. Yeah, like crazy influential. Speaking of the Fifth Element, this French graphic novelist also did a lot of the designs on the Fifth Element. So this guy, his name is much longer than this, but his pen name is uh, is Hub H U B, and he wrote a series called Oko. And there's four books. And I thought I had pitched this before, but apparently I have not. Um, There's four books. There's a cycle of water, air, earth, and fire. And fire comes out this week is the collected edition of that. So the the issues have been done for a while. But this is put out by Archaea Press. It's been translated into English now. Um, But it's a French graphic novel about this uh, land. um, And I can't... I think it's called Pagin or Pagin or something. I can't remember what the name of the place... That Pagia? they are, Pagia. May I don't know what it is. Pie? Pretty sure it's piglet. It's piglet. Basically, Japan. Pizza. It's uh, it's set in basically Japan, but there's a lot of magic. So it's this is a fantastic fantasy comic. Uh, it Oko is a Ronin. He's a, a samurai without a master, and he's basically wandering around having awesome adventures uh, around this world. Um, oh, actually, it's in this trade that I have here next to me. That's easy. Uh, Pajan, like P-A-J-N is how you spell the empire. Mm. And uh, the, so it's Oko, which is a Ronin, and then he has this guy, Noboro, who's this masked guy who seems unkillable. And then there's a couple, there's a monk notion, and then there's this young thief guy, uh, Tiku. And they go and have these adventures throughout this land, and there's, uh, it's like very kind of feudal Japan looking. Uh, if you like stuff like Samurai Champloo or you like Samurai Heaven and Earth, uh, it's very much a story about, you know, Japan in the Samurai era. Like if you like um, the, uh, what is that movie? Uh, Princess Mononoke. Like it's somewhat reminiscent of that. There's not as many like magical spirit creatures but there are definitely monsters in this and there are definitely some like uh oni and demons and stuff and um the art's fin- phenomenal the art's why i picked it up i'm like really really drawn to the way that they color and it's it's very european you're drawn to the art i'm drawn to the art yeah um uh, that's not a pun yeah, it's yeah. just how i talk joe a little, a little would you say it's at all similar to yusagi ojimbo yes uh although a little bit more hardcore, less kind of whimsical. No, I, I actually think that it's it's equally whimsical, but I feel like Yusagi's characters are more grounded in. Um, this is more, more like mythic Japan. But this is yeah, mythical. This is more. Like this reminds me more of like Conan. Okay, mm, but like uh-uh. if Conan was said my word right there, I know, yeah. right? <laughs> he knows all word the for... words that I want to hear. Yeah, it's like it's like a Japanese uh, version of Conan, and Oko's a <laughs> fucking badass, and nice. and his the guy that travels with him who is uh, faceless. You never see his face. He's wearing like a big ceremonial Japanese samurai mask. Kicks the shit out of a lot of stuff, and it's awesome. And it's it's a great story. And I've yet to read the fourth volume, but the first three were fantastic. And there's some cool shit going on in here. There's like mages that can shoot lightning and magic bolts out. There's like weird mythical creatures. They fight some like living trees and shit. And uh, it's cool. It's a really cool series. And if you like European graphic novels, like this is cool because they just you know they put it out when it's ready. So I've been reading this since before I worked at the shop. It's now just finishing after I stopped working at a comic book store. So it's been like, I don't know, I'd say almost eight years for this to come out. Um, and I'm sure it was out in French well before it came out in English. So, um, And I'm a huge fan of French graphic novels. 
I'm super torn because there are a lot of good comics this week. And uh, yeah, there yeah, really there's really only are. four issues in each trade, but they're big issues. They're like 40 pages in the issues. So Can I just not make a choice and go to sleep? Actually, you get to make the first choice, Joe. Fuck you. Just Podcast canceled. <laughs> Fuck you, Chard. I don't know. Oh, my God. No, you know what? I gotta read about fucking Samurai Conan. I, I how can I not do that? It's Conan. I fucking love Conan. It's it's uh. I mean, he's not like Conan. I mean, he is a Sam. He's a Ronin, no, so he's much still, more like, similar to like you know uh, to Jin in Samurai Champion. That, that's and, just and that's as good. Just as I good. mean, fuck. Mannix. <sighs> yeah, this is hard. God, there's a lot of good ones this week. Um. Iron Fist, I know I love, and I could have a really good conversation about. Oko, I've never read, and you said Conan, so I got to Oko. All right. Just, I haven't read it yet. Kate. The Frank book. Nice. I am also going to vote for the Frank book. <laughs> oh, shit! So we're reading the Frank book. Yeah. Nice. Wow. I did not. That turned it. around fast. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna vote for Doctor Strange because you guys fucking know how much I love Doctor Strange. I knew Doctor Strange, I mean, but I can't. I want to read Doctor our... Strange. Maybe not that Doctor Strange. I oh, want to read the shit out of that Doctor Strange. Strange. That looks so fucking good. That's why I started my own podcast. I'm gonna talk about Doctor Strange. I, wanna, I, I will be on that Doctor with Strange you. and Dracula, motherfucker. I'm gonna do I it. I will be on that. We just talk I, about Doctor Strange all the time podcast. Listen, I'm ready to do it. No, I'm so sad. now. I seriously, I'm thinking about doing a Doctor Strange like long form podcast. Oh, let's I'm do, not it. Even, let's do it. I'm not even joking. Starting with Strange Tales 110 and fucking going through everything. I will be on some. I will bring Doctor Strange. The Oath sometime. All right. Oh, is the, the Mark really Wade good. one? Yeah, he hooks up yeah. with Night Nurse. No, no, uh, I, uh, I really it's like uh, that it's one. Uh, is it Marcos Michael? Martin and Brian K. Vaughn. Oh, yes. okay. The same team? Damn, that's what I should have pitched! Oh, Shit, that would have been, oh, been the perfect segue. <laughs> <laughs> I just got so excited about my new pick. My new pick. <laughs> that was like one of the last uh, times Doctor Strange had like his own series. No, the Mark Wade mini series was the four. What was that one? The Oath was the last miniseries. But the one said. before that, was that the Mark Wade that, one? That was the Mark Wade one. I That was just that called one. Strange. Yeah, that one And then like, before that was the J. Michael Straczynski one. That was just okay. Yeah. That's yeah. A, that's most of J. Michael Straczynski. Pretty much, it's, yeah. It's, it's okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. Right. it's good. I, mean, I loved it's some bad. of his amazing okay. Spider-Man stuff, his but some Spider-Man of it was crap. The start of his run was great. The end was like... Well, Again, that's most of that's uh, most. Of his Jay Thor is my favorite thing. His Thor is amazing all the way through. I love his Thor. And then they his Superman was some up. bullshit. And he made Superman all emo. He also wrote... wait a minute. He did grounded, didn't he? That yeah. shit was weak. Yes. Uh, yeah, oh my god. Feelings about that because I like some of it, but oh. then other parts. Of he my... didn't write all of it. G. Willow Wilson came in and did like a fill-in issue that was actually pretty good. And, like, I, I always... think he left and James Robinson finished it for him using his notes, so it got I... better because he wasn't actually writing it anymore. I always wondered who had the power to send Superman to his room. That Lois grounded. Yeah, oh, his... Superman grounded. No, it's... probably Mom Pa Kent. You would his think, parents. but. That would be too obvious. It's I just imagine that famous. they have the Kryptonian ring that that they, he later gives to Bruce, and they used to beat him with it. <laughs> it's true. Child abuse. Nobody wants to talk about. Not that. a funny subject. <laughs> so for next time, the Frank book. Wow, yeah. two Frank in a row. Book. Fucking who's on fire? Yeah. I'm not because if I were, I'd be rolling around on the ground. Yeah. You do that anyway. Stop, drive, and roll. Well, yeah, but, but uh, more urgent. I'm really excited because was... I picked the Frank book last time that you pitched it. That That's was true. What I, I was read, actually so I'm kind of pumped about that. I think last time I pitched it, we were in a similar situation where yeah. everybody had kind of. I never was like a lot book. of good stuff going on. We're all like. Yeah, this was a really hard choice, and I, that's why I, I took a minute and I was just like, "Okay, what does my gut say?" My gut says we need to talk about Frank. Nice. Just because. Yeah, sweet. Okay. And now well, I have to wait another year and a half to pitch Iron Fist Iron for a Fist third again. time. All right. Well. well, you know, I'm I'm glad because uh, I got to see Jim Woodring speed and, and do a a, a fucking um, a demonstration of this giant seven foot tall pen yes, he uses <laughs> uh, called the Nibis Maximus. I think is what it's called, and he's just. Uh, he uses know, a seven foot tall pen. Yeah, you know, it's insane. Like he made this drawing. He doesn't use it uh, for all his drawings, but he had it specifically made, and he he draws these really oversized drawings. Oh, okay. and he'll spend like hours on them. It's like it's just 
something he does. And that's, I think that right there kind of sets up exactly what your expectation for the Frank book should be. Cause that's, that's the kind awesome. of mind these stories are coming from. He that's also has cool. incredible facial hair. He does he have does. incredible facial hair and he's incredibly like as a creator, he's incredibly open about his ideas. He's very listening to him speak was uh, a pleasure because he's really a, an interesting guy. So. Yeah. He seemed to care more about what other people thought his books were about than what he intended them to be about. Well, yeah, because he, and he they're, didn't they're wanna... so open because there's no dialogue that that's he likes cool. to hear. Yeah, other, and that's what, that's what other kind people of... interpret. Yeah, that's awesome. All that's right. why I'm kind of stoked on it. Isn't yeah, I'm so. excited as well. All right, podcast over. All right. Podcast. Thanks for listening, over. guys. Bye. Catch you next time. Bye. See you guys. Thank you for listening to me from the gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title, but like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes review. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.